Hi, I'm Paul J. Welcome to the analysis.news. Please don't forget the donate button at the top of the web page. And if you're on YouTube, there's a subscribe button in the corner and, and a share button too. Be back in a second. In the statement that announced the American Jobs Plan, that's the Biden administration's infrastructure plan, it says, quote, while the American Rescue Plan is changing the course of the pandemic and delivering relief for working families, this is no time to build back the way things were. This is the moment to reimagine and rebuild a new economy. So does this plan do it? The amount of the investment that's been announced is roughly $2.25 trillion. And while it's far from clear what the final bill will actually look like, at first look, it does seem at least a more serious plan in the direction of addressing the climate crisis. But given the scope and urgency of the crisis, is it enough? And is the way the money is being targeted going to be effective? We're going to look at the plan, and not so much just about the politics, about whether it might pass or not, which is what most of the media is talking about. In other words, if this plan is the plan that becomes law, will it address the urgency and scale of what's facing us? Now joining us to unpack the Biden plan is Robert Pollan. He's the co-founder of Perry, the Political Economy Research Institute in Amherst, Massachusetts. He's the co-author of a book with Noam Chomsky titled Climate Crisis and the Global Green New Deal, The Political Economy of Saving the Planet. Thanks for joining me, Bob. Very glad to be on. Thank you, Paul. Let me just add to my intro just one note, and you might comment on this a bit, and then we'll get into the plan. It's a rather unique moment for such a big infrastructure plan because of the pandemic, uh, because of the you know, recession and the, the danger of a even deepening economic crisis. Uh, Wall Street, on the whole, doesn't seem to be adverse to a big infrastructure plan. Of course, lots of the banks own lots of companies that will make money out of such a plan. But still, the adverse, the normal way they are adverse to uh, deficits and the yelling about the problems of inflation, we're hearing very little of that from, from the banks. And we're not even hearing that much pushback to what Biden uh, plans to do in terms of raising taxes to pay for some of this. So maybe you can just comment on this kind of moment we're in, and then we'll get into more of the details of the plan. I agree. It's a historically unique moment. I mean, the, the COVID recession, uh, in terms of its severity, over the last year was actually greater than even the 1930s depression. Um, of course, the 1930s depression lasted for a decade. This one is so far about a year. Um, you know, half the people in the country, in the U.S. experienced layoffs, uh, unprecedented. Um, and, you know, the, the levels of, uh, Poverty increase, or obviously people dying from COVID. Um, it's really just been a severe crisis. Now, uh, the point is that with universal vaccination or near universal vaccination, maybe we can come out of it. But we've already had, you know, massive numbers of business closings. And so it's, you know, just to say we're going to go back to where we were is impossible in the face of it because of the composition of the economy has changed because of the job losses and business losses. So, uh, yeah, build back somehow, hopefully better. Uh, that's really the question. And keep in mind that even uh, the severity of the recession was, you know, 50% of the uh, workforce laid off over the course of the year. That's despite the fact that we spent 14% of GDP, $3 trillion on a stimulus program, and the Federal Reserve poured in $4 trillion, nearly 20% of GDP, to prop up Wall Street, which is, by the way, why uh, stock prices have gone up by almost 50%. This is also unprecedented. There's never been any kind of recession, downturn, financial crisis, uh, in which you know, jobs are getting lost, but Wall Street is going up. Stock prices went up by 50 percent. 
And uh, we've all seen the numbers of the increase in wealth of the of a few billionaires. I can't remember the exact number, but it's it's stratospheric increase in their uh, pro- wealth over the course of the pandemic. Yeah. Well, it's been concentrated in the uh, tech sector where you have these giant firms that can operate just fine. In fact, they're designed to operate fine online. Uh, and that's really been the thing that's driven them, other than the general increase in the stock market due to the Federal Reserve intervention. Remember, $4 trillion intervention. Uh, that's a lot of money uh, within one year. Um, so, uh, you know, there's been this massive disparity between people that, whose jobs rely on in-person contact going someplace. So, uh, only about 5% of the jobs in the lower 25% of the wage distribution are jobs that can be done online. Whereas in the upper 25% of the wage distribution, about 55% uh, of all the jobs can be done online. And so that represents a lot of what's going on with tech. Uh, their online activity has uh, substituted for what had been in-person activity. Okay, so let's get to the plan. So this plan that we're talking about is supposed to be a plan that addresses the, quote, crumbling is the word people always use, crumbling American infrastructure, which I guess it is. But even more importantly, uh, use the infrastructure plan to address the climate crisis and climate change. So you you wrote a book uh, with Noam Chomsky with a plan. so just in, in broad strokes, to what extent does the Biden plan uh, live up to the Poland Chomsky plan? So the Biden plan, uh, let me first say it's different than what he proposed when he was a candidate. And I think months ago we talked about what he had proposed as a candidate. So as a candidate, he had proposed $2 trillion dollars over four years, so ad- averages to $500 billion a year. So as you mentioned just now, his new plan is $2.3 trillion over eight years. So that's a little less than $300 billion. So already, without any kind of pushback from anybody, at least officially, publicly, he's already cut the plan on an annual basis by about 40%, from $500 billion to roughly $300 Billion. Okay, just just to say again, cut it from the plan he campaigned on. Yes, he cut it from the so-called Build Back Better proposal that he was campaigning on. Okay, now still uh, the question is: Well, is this enough? What does it mean to be enough? Well, the first and foremost, we'd have to say, you know, is it enough to get, move the U.S. onto a climate stabilization path? Uh, okay, so let's say we've got this total of 300 billion, and it's hard to know exactly, but by, I've been playing with some of the numbers. In it. I would say it's fair to say that about a third of it is some are in investment areas that would um, help us reduce emissions and move on to an alternative energy system and reduce uh, emissions from other sources, including agriculture. So that means 100 billion a year. Now, the thing, thank you for mentioning my book with my obscure co author that nobody's <laughs> ever heard of. Um, I'm Chomsky, yeah, fabulous guy, by the way. Uh, anyway, um, what I've been estimating in, in the work with Noam, but also more generally, we need about 600 billion. I think we need about 600 billion dollars per year on average over 30 years to get to a zero emissions economy. So we could say that Biden is giving us 100 billion and we need 600 billion. Um, so obviously not enough, but it's, it's clear also that I, I myself always said that, look, most of the money should come from the private sector incentivized by public policy. So Biden does have uh, some measures that would incentivize the private sector. 
Uh, Bob, before you get to that, let me just ask you something about something you said. How do you get to the one third number? That that of this package, it's only one third that really is directed to the climate. Well, because as you mentioned, a lot of it is going for traditional infrastructure, bridges, roads, water systems. Uh, a lot of it is going to broadband development, uh, universal broadband. That's desirable, but it's not going to bring down emissions. Uh, a lot of it is going to support uh, the care economy, elder care, child care, also very important and uh, highly worthy, but it's not going to bring down emissions. Uh, so when you look at it, it's, it's, it, there's some ways it's not that easy to break it all out because some things kind of get double counted, but I think it's fair to say that roughly one third is uh, d doing something that'll help reduce emissions. Uh, some of the other things like which are quite valuable also are uh, resilience, climate resilience. So adaptation, uh, like, you know, building seawalls or uh, uh, making the, making agriculture more resilient. Also extremely worthy uh, and addressing real needs of people but it's not going to bring down emissions. Uh, also, retrofitting buildings uh, is one you've talked about many times, but same thing. Not, not. No, it does. That brings down emissions because you don't consume energy. Yeah. So, no, that's very important. That's one of the key things. And uh, they do give attention to that. So that's good. So, you know, in my opinion, two things bring down emissions, raising energy efficiency standards and building out renewable energy systems. So that's when I say we need 600 billion a year. We need it to uh, raise energy efficiency standards quite dramatically. Uh, in other words, I'm assuming the economy is going to keep growing over time, but our energy consumption, any kind of energy, does not increase at all. It stays flat uh, so that we become more efficient every year. And then for the energy that we need, I'm assuming we're going to, uh, fulfill that with solar, wind, geothermal, maybe some hydro and some small scale, small scale hydro and some bioenergy, low emissions bioenergy. We also have to invest in reforestation and organic agriculture because those things will absorb CO2. So that well, that's where I get the 600 billion. If you're not doing any of those things, you're not reducing emissions. So that's that's kind of it. So that's where I think. He's got about a uh, 100 bill, roughly 100 billion public money going into anything that will reduce emissions. Okay, so you're saying to get closer to that 600, Biden has some measures that would uh, stimulate uh, private investment. Uh, let me first ask you, what's the, what's the virtue of that? Why don't just tax the private sector and come up with the 600 billion? Well, uh, yes, you could do that. It's not realistic politically to get, I don't think, to get that much increase in taxation. Uh, I mean, he has proposed an increase in the corporate tax. But, I mean, I myself don't, I don't think it's a bad idea to let the private sector have a big role in this. As I may have mentioned at a, some other time, I myself am a uh, clean energy capitalist, a small scale. Uh, but there's nothing wrong, I don't think, with having, you know, community investment projects. It doesn't have, we don't all, especially with clean energy, we don't have to think of it as, uh, big corporate utilities or big oil companies. Quite the contrary. It's an opportunity for a lot of communities to start developing small scale energy systems. And so, uh, you know, if you have the right incentive structure, you can get I don't know that you can get the 500 billion that you need, but you can get a significant amount. But th that then means that you have to have very strong regulations and incentives. And the regulation, he does, they do have one significant regulation. The problem is it's too big. They say they want to have 80% uh, of all electricity generated by clean energy in uh, 2030 and 100% by 2035. Now, the point is, if that's real, I mean, then, yeah, then the private sector is going to invest 
in clean energy because they have to. But what if this is this just aspirational? Well, that would be very nice. Uh, then it's meaningless, as has been the case in a lot of, like in New York State, they had something similar, renewable portfolio standard. I studied it for in 2015. There's supposed to be a 30 percent uh, renewable electricity. They never got there. Nobody. There wasn't a single article in the press. Uh, there wasn't a single memo within the whole state government saying, "Whoops, we missed it." They just made up a new one. And so, if it's all going to be rhetoric, of course we're not going to get anywhere. So, uh, I don't know. Realistically speaking, uh, what? First of all, what's in the Biden plan that would facilitate, stimulate this private investment? And if it isn't enough, uh, shouldn't there be a lot more money on the table from the government? And and two, given this unique moment where Wall Street doesn't seem to be at all concerned with inflation or debt, uh, you don't have to necessarily tax it to get to the $600 billion. Now They're creating money left, right, and center. They can just make some more. Yeah. Well, um, I think that the, uh, you know, the Biden plan, relative to things that we've had before, including Obama, is, is extremely ambitious. We want to, I want to give them credit for that. It's also, uh, at least so far in rhetoric, it is very strong in support of, uh, you know, job creation. It's called the American Jobs Plan. So, yeah, you know, this is also a massive sea change. When I first started working on this issue of, uh, you know, green energy transition and job creation, I did it precisely because the prevailing view was you can save the planet or you can create jobs, but you can't do both. Right. And I was saying, well, actually, the two, of course, go together because you're going to have to invest in a new activities, which will create jobs. That seems to have sunk in. And so that's really important. And secondly, they do talk about these jobs being union jobs. I would also add that they do positively talk about investments in underserved communities, communities that have been badly hit uh, by uh, the impacts of, of utilities, uh, pollution, and so forth. So those are all positives. Uh, but in the end, if we're real, if we're real, we've got to get to somewhere in the order of 600 billion a year. And by the way, that's just for the United States. Biden's plan doesn't say anything about the rest of the world. And we have to, we have an obligation to help finance the green transition in the rest of the world. So there's not enough there. Wall Street, what do they think? Well, uh, you know, there is, of all people, Larry Summers, who was, a top advisor to Clinton and then Obama, Harvard uh, professor of economics. He's the one saying that the inflationary dangers are very serious. Uh, I don't think there is. There are many other people that are agreeing with him. I myself don't agree with it. Um, the debt issue, right? The government, you know, the, gov the government can borrow at one percent now. So why not borrow long term at one percent? And, you know, the the burden of the debt is going to be trivial. Uh, so, yeah, they could get they could get up to uh, more than 100 billion easily. The government. Uh, it seemed to me that they're coming up with trillions. Uh, they got a tr uh, 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 you know, we've discussed this before. You don't necessarily have to take the money from the Pentagon, but they got a trillion dollars over the next decade and, and a little more going into nuclear weapons. And they're building Ford class aircraft carriers at 14, 15 billion a piece. I mean, clearly, you know, the, the, the money can be done if they're if they're really serious about this. So. While I you don't I, even have to be a hundred percent serious. You can be half serious. Half right. serious. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I mean, and, look at that. I was just going to say the, the bar. Fed. The bar is so low. I mean, you can't even consider Trump part of the bar. Uh, but the Obama administration, you know, it was a, a, a rather modest, and this certainly goes significantly further. Although it's very different conditions uh, now about what is possible. But uh, when I look at the plan, the very first thing, and this is your, the point you made right off the top, the very first thing in the plan is fix highways, rebuild bridges, upgrade airports and transit system, 
uh, modernize highways and roads. I mean, none of this really has anything to do with lowering emissions. And that's, and apparently that's, I don't know, I, I don't know if you know the breakdown, but a, a large part of the money is going to that, right? That's what I mean. So, I mean, you know, if one third is going to energy and maybe 10% is going to the care economy, roughly half we're talking about is going to traditional infrastructure. Um, so the other thing is, uh, and we have talked about this before when we talked to when Biden was a candidate, um, they, they're very careful in their use of words and, and their words matter. You know, the terminology that has been around for a long time in terms of limiting fossil fuel uh, consumption with utilities was, quote, renewable portfolio standards. Okay? Now, I just looked at the plan uh, before we got on, and it's actually clean energy uh, standards, meaning now it's not renewable energy so much. It could be uh, carbon capture technology with fossil fuels and nuclear power. And I that is being pushed, I think, extremely hard. I just saw a piece in the Financial Times today where Senator Manchin, this, you know, this pivotal person in the middle between the Democrats and Republicans from, from West Virginia says, you know, if you want to save the planet, then you must be for carbon capture technology. In other words, carbon capture meaning you burn oil, you burn coal, you burn natural gas, and we have a technology to capture the bad stuff, the carbon, and store it underground forever. My understanding is that environmentalists, uh, you know, who's against carbon capture? It's not about being against carbon capture. There's just no evidence that carbon capture works or certainly works on a scale that could be effective given the timing uh, urgency of the crisis. Uh, it's, 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 it sounds like he's talking about some moral thing about being against carbon capture. It just ain't, it, it ain't real in the given moment. Is, am I wrong about that? Well, I personally am not big on carbon capture and, and uh, for many reasons. Uh, number one is you're right. There's no evidence as yet that it works on scale. If you look at the most recent study from the Energy Department, U.S. Energy Department, came out in February, meaning it was prepared while Trump was still in office. And it costs out the electricity generation from coal with carbon capture, solar, uh, wind, geothermal, nuclear, et cetera. Okay. Uh, coal with carbon capture is 7.3 cents per kilowatt. Uh, hour of electricity. Solar uh, photovoltaic is half that, or less than half that. It's 3.2 cents. Uh, wind is 3.7 cents. Geothermal is 3.7 cents. Nuclear is 7 cents. So, I mean, if you're just like a strictly greedy, cost-cutting capitalist, then you say, oh, wait, oh, we should be using renewable energy. We shouldn't be using cold carbon capture or nuclear. Obviously, the reason they want to do carbon capture is to keep the fossil fuel companies alive. There's no other reason. Uh, but uh, that's where we are. And let's say, you know, we're talking about a time scale. We're going to need to get to 50% reduction in nine years by 2030. Um, we already know that solar, wind, they work. Uh, and their costs are coming down. Solar costs have come down by 80% in just the last decade. Whereas coal with carbon capture hasn't seen it work at all. And, you know, the energy department is saying, well, maybe you can get it to work, but it'll cost twice as much. So why are we doing this? We're doing it to preserve the fossil fuel companies. Now, we talked about the importance of retrofitting buildings, you know, insulating and so on, so they, uh, both in terms of cooling and heating are more efficient. And we gave some credit to the Biden plan. But the Biden plan, according to the statement, they're only talking about 2 million homes and buildings. Uh, am I wrong? But that is barely a drop in the bucket of, of the number of buildings. And it's one of the most effective strategies they could they could possibly come up with. Why only 2 million? Yeah, that's, that's extremely low. And yes, uh, retrofitting buildings is the most efficient way, not in the United States, in the whole world, 
It is the most efficient way to bring down emissions, way cheaper than anything else. One tenth the cost of, I already mentioned that, you know, solar and so forth are much cheaper than fossil fuels and nuclear. Retrofitting buildings is one tenth the cost of solar. So, uh, of course you should be retrofitting every single building and it saves people money. And uh, it's going to bring down emissions at a very low cost and very quickly. And it creates the most number of jobs. It's very labor. You know, it's people coming into buildings and doing the retrofit. Uh, let me add something to that, having lived in Baltimore for a few years. I, I think I'm a little speculating here. You can correct me if I'm wrong. But it's the, it's the kind of job that people could be trained for rather quickly. So if you're talking about increasing uh employment, especially in the poorer areas of inner cities and, and everywhere, really. But, you know, relatively unskilled workers can learn and be trained to retrofit you know, buildings. So as an, as an employment thing, it's, it's, it's one of the most effective. It's the most effective. It's the best thing all around. Um, there are issues with it, just like there are issues with everything else. Like you do have to get you know, you have to get permission to go into people's homes and people, oh, I got to go to work. It's a hassle. You know, I don't want you to screw up my house. Um, I, I know this uh, again from my own business. We've experienced that and it's, it, there are issues with it. So, uh, it's easier to do it in commercial buildings. It's easier to do it in big apartment buildings. Um, but basically it should be done. And uh, it can be done, and, and it is highly cost. It is uh, is by far the cheapest way to. Well, maybe that's the problem with it. You know, uh, is that it's too cost efficient. In other words, if I'm a Wall Street investment banker, uh, I'm going to make a heck of a lot less money out of a massive investment in retrofitting versus. Uh, bridges and, and all. And, oh, yeah. you know, again, I think broadband's fantastic and it, and it must be done. Uh, rural broadband is just terrible. Uh, but, but, but a lot of the places they're putting money in this plan are places where, you know, corporate America will make more money and the place that's maybe more effective in terms of climate, there's less investment going. Whereas, you know, in 2009, you know, the global economy almost completely collapsed because of these things, uh, the securitized mortgage for subprime mortgages. So if you want to figure out a way to finance doing something in people's homes that are not rich people, Wall Street already figured that out in the most uh, malicious way possible. But you could do the same kind of thing. You could securitize these retrofitting projects. You build in the savings into the costs of people who are paying their electricity bill. Well, let's say their electricity bill has gone down by 40%. So you keep paying in uh, to your to your bank until you've covered the cost. It all could be done very easily. Uh, there, the the biggest issue is uh, you know in terms of this problem of getting getting people to agree to it, uh, you know, it, it would be it's very labor intensive and you have to communicate with every homeowner. <clears throat> they have to agree to let you in their house. Uh, th these are the things I myself encountered in trying to do it as a as a business person. Now, it's it's not just about homes, though. It's, it's office buildings. No, office buildings uh, should be way easier because. People don't have, own office buildings because they love their office buildings. They're doing it to make money. And if you tell them, we're going to lower your energy costs by 50% and we're going to be able to do it on a zero interest or 1% interest loan, uh, it should, it should go really, really quickly. Yeah. It's, it's, a, it is a great way to, to help save the planet. All right. So let's go back to the beginning of that because when you, when you break out, well, what you did in the beginning, that it's only a hundred, a third of this is uh, is for climate is directly climate issues. Um, and we look at retrofitting and it's only, I can't believe this, number, two million homes. I mean, it's crazy. But there's more than two million homes in, in, in some of the smaller cities of the United States, never mind the country. Uh, it makes you wonder if the climate part of this is kind of more window dressing 
and the uh, infrastructure spending that will make you know companies that are manufacture construction equipment and so on uh, a lot of money and 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 they're not yet still aren't really serious and there's no you know i would i would think from what i understand of this issue this four years is probably the most pivotal last chance gasp <laughs> at hitting that one point you know staying under 1.5 degrees celsius warming above uh, pre-industrial temperatures you know that target that now all the scientists are saying it's no longer you know about two degrees it's about as you said like nine years and so if there's any chance of staying within uh, this window of, of opportunity uh, it's this four years and and this is the plan for this four years and they're even talking about compromising with some republicans and some uh, centrist right-wing Democrats like the guy from West Virginia you mentioned. So it might not even be this. Well, uh, yeah, it's pretty clear. Uh, there was this report that came out last month from the UN where the Secretary General of the UN says 2021 is the pivotal year because, you know, to get investment projects going, is you know, it's nice to talk about them and to pass laws and all. But to actually get them going is going to take two or three years, I mean, at scale. So we have to act now in order to have any chance to hit the, the target for uh, 2030. And, you know, the Biden plan itself, as I said, he's calling for 80 percent reduction in fossil fuel uh, electricity. Well, no, again, it's not fossil fuel. Clean, 80 percent clean energy uh, uh, electric electricity generation. That's in nine years. Now, we have to really like get on it to have any chance of getting close to that. And that's why I say, well, it sounds really good, but what happens if we don't hit it? Is anybody going to jail? Uh, are they paying $100 million fines? Uh, so far, that hasn't been included. And if we don't, if it's all voluntary, aspirational, ain't going to happen. So Biden's having this meeting with the uh, leaders of uh, Russia and China, and, and there's other meetings that have been going on in Europe amongst leaders. Um, if this is what the most that the U.S. is uh, willing to do, um, what, what, you know, Biden trying to play the role of the global leader on climate, and he's going to rally these other countries that, you know, at least in the American press, uh, are being portrayed as sort of being more reluctant to do something, especially China. Um, and actually, I do want to ask you about China, but let's uh, sort of next. Uh, but how to, <laughs> what, what moral authority does Biden really have here? Because, the, you know, these other countries can parse these numbers uh, uh, the way you are. Well, uh, the European Green Deal, uh, I've also read that, has a lot of beautiful rhetoric. Um, the, the level of, of money that they're, they've committed is even less than Biden. Uh, it's something in the range of one half of 1% of GDP of, uh, of, the, of the European economies, whereas the Biden one, uh, the public spending is about a half a percent of GDP. So the Biden one, a lot of it does depend on, well, can we actually mobilize the private sector. And if you actually had a regulation that said, you know what, by 2035, it's 100% renewable electricity or everybody goes to jail. Uh, but th then you then you will get 100% renewable electricity from private investors. And, you know, the auto companies, uh, they're saying, you know, 100% automobiles uh, electric by 2035. It's voluntary, you know, when Trump was in, they were against it altogether. So, I mean, these have to be binding commitments. And if you have binding commitments from the private sector, well, maybe maybe we're on a decent track. But we can't just uh, have the federal government spend $100 billion and then just say, okay, the private sector, is, oh, they'll probably come along. Uh, we don't know that. The... Uh Unfortunate thing here is, as we know, uh, the real priority of the Biden, and not just the Biden, of every administration, uh, is to win the next election. 
uh, and and this this looks like a document which is uh, calculated. How do we win in 2022? How are we going to get reelected in 2024? And and climate at least climate's on the radar now, but it's a bit late just to be on the radar. And 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 this plan looks like a more an electioneering kind of positioning. Let's see how many sectors we can please, especially in the finance sector. Um, okay. I don't want to be so pessimistic about this thing, but when you when you dig into it, you don't come out optimistic. Well, you know what Gramsci says: pessimism of the mind, optimism of the will. So uh, <laughs> I think that uh, it's it's something. I mean, relative to where we were six months ago, you know, this is glorious. Of course, it's not adequate, and of course, there's going to be more compromises. But actually, um, you know, Manchin, uh, I actually met with Manchin staff uh, about a month ago because I wrote a study focused on West Virginia transition. And Manchin is, you know, he's kind of slowly, he's saying some favorable things. He's saying that, uh, you know, a, a transition to renewable economy is, uh, you know, a long-term goal. On the other hand, he says we have to have carbon capture. But, you know, I think six months ago, he would have said, "Don't you know, why would I even listen to somebody like you? What's the point? Uh, so there has been movement. And, you know, let's give credit where it's due. It's tremendous work by organizers all over the country, different sorts, including people in the labor movement, uh, which also is new, uh, that even you're even getting labor uh, leaders in the, tra in the building trades who have been vehemently opposed to all this. Uh, to start to come around. In fact, even yesterday, there was a piece in the New York Times that the head of the um, United Mine Workers, Cecil Roberts, said he will support a renewable transition in exchange for good jobs. So where is that in this plan? Why aren't they just straightforwardly promising that workers in the fossil fuel industry will transition e either to the sustainable energy or whatever but will not lose a penny of their salary that they'll get subsidized uh, and, until there until there is a transition why don't they just come out and offer that they do talk about transition so that's a positive they do talk about it they do say it's important do they say what you say that everybody's guaranteed a job everybody's pension is guaranteed everybody's wages will stay the same no they don't uh, that's basically the plan that i developed including in west virginia I costed it out, even for West Virginia, which is the most coal dependent state in the country, even for West Virginia. If you give every single person employed in the fossil fuel sector and any ancillary sectors in West Virginia, and every single one of them is, is guaranteed a pension, guaranteed another job, and guaranteed the same wages, plus you throw in money for a relocation and retraining as needed. We're talking about less than one fifth of one percent of West Virginia's GDP a year. I'm guessing that's less than the money the Fed used to prop up the stock market. Uh, the stock market got propped up with 20 percent of U.S. GDP. This is less than one fifth of one percent of West Virginia. No, the, the numbers are minuscule. Keep in mind, and for coal, there's only 60,000 people in the whole country. They're employed in the coal industry, 30,000 of whom are doing things other than mining coal. They're secretaries, they're accountants, they're lawyers. Those jobs are easily transferable. 30,000 people in a labor force of 160 million. You know, you can fit 30,000 people into, you know, the, the Patriots, the New, New England Patriots Stadium and still have 60,000 seats left. It's hard to, from a, even a narrow partisan political point of view, the Democrats, I don't know, would destroy the Republicans in a place like West Virginia with an offer like this. I mean, how? I mean, I know there's other there's other issues, but still, that's that's exactly what I told uh, Manchin staff. By the way, they were they were at least maybe they were being polite, but they were pretty favorable in our discussion. We'll see what comes of it. All right, just before we end this a little bit, I've been reading an article. I guess it's in the magazine Foreign Affairs. I think. Uh, where the authors are talking about China's climate policy, uh, essentially saying it's smoke and mirrors. 
that while they've set this target of 2060 to be carbon neutral, um, or net zero, I guess the, is the term, uh, but, th but it's not realistic because of the amount of coal they continue to bring online and the dependency on coal, and that to meet the growth targets that, that the Communist Party of China has set for the country, it's impossible at this stage for them to do it without a lot more coal. Um, so, I mean, is that, do you think that's a correct assessment that, that we're also looking at smoke and mirrors, <laughs> a lot of smoke uh, from the Chinese? Uh, I don't know yet. I mean, the Chinese, you know, I mentioned before that the cost of solar panel, uh, the solar electricity has come down 82% in, in nine years. I mean, that's astounding. And it's still coming down. That's due to China. China is the one that drove those costs down. We can't, U.S., Europe, we can't take any credit. So they have invested and, you know, they want to dominate the, the clean energy industry for the next generation. And if they keep up the way they're going, they probably will. It's also true that they are hedging their bets and they're building out coal. So, uh, you know, the, these goals, uh, they, they have to become binding. And just to say you're going to get to zero and not do anything about it means nothing. Just like the Paris, the 2015 Paris Agreement, the greatest climate agreement in history, um, if you actually look at what every country pledged to do, there will be no emission reduction at all in the next 20 years. Zero. That's the Paris Agreement. So it's really critical that we get beyond, you know, the political rhetoric and really dig into what's uh, possible. And the, the thing is, building out a clean energy, a green economy is affordable. It's, you know, my model says it's two and a half percent of global GDP a year. Um, another model from the International Renewable Energy Agency comes at almost exactly the same number that I came in, totally different methodology. Uh, other models, more or less the same. So two and a half, two, three percent of GDP not, is, is affordable. It will create millions, tens of millions of jobs. It will lower energy costs. It'll raise health standards. And guess what? It'll save the planet. That's what I would call the Green New Deal. All right. Thanks for joining us, Bob. All right. Thanks a lot, Paul. And thank you for joining us on the analysis.news. Don't forget the donate button, the subscribe button, the share button, all the buttons. And uh, see you again next time.